Here we are, but straying pilgrims. Is that how I see myself? Is that how you see yourself? Would you self-identify as a pilgrim? And if so, does acknowledging that current status, pilgrim, significantly impact the way that you live day by day? You know, those questions, uh, I hope they're thoughtful to you, but those thoughtful questions are not only prompted by the lyrics that we just sang, here we are, but straying pilgrims. But also those questions are pertinent, I believe, in the development of our current series. Living a life filled with hope. Now, now please don't forget that throughout this series we have emphasized uh, the challenge for each of us, beginning with me, is to keep before us and, and honestly contemplate this question. Am I living that kind of life? Can can my life as a Christian accurately be described as a life filled with hope? Is mine a a life abounding with hope? In in so much that it even defines who I am. Uh, Does my hope as a Christian make a real difference in the life that I live? Is that hope so conspicuously exhibited by my attitudes and my behaviors in life so that observers of me might see it and even ask of me a reason for that hope. Now, if we can answer yes to those questions, and I hope we can, but if we can answer yes to those questions, it is and will be because our lives lives are filled with hope. A hope that is inspiring and a hope that is empowering. Again, as it relates to that second one, friends, if if the hope that we have as a Christian is going to dramatically impact the daily lives that we live, it must be an empowering hope. Now, in a previous lesson, we've uh, certainly recognized that hope, the Christian's hope, is a hope that's filled with power. But the question has to do with my appropriating that power. In, In other words, allowing that powerful hope to empower me. To do what? Well, empower me to cultivate and promote within my life spiritual qualities that are imperative to being the children that God would have us to be. Looking forward to that inheritance inheritance that He's promised to us as His faithful children. In other words, we're, we're talking about a hope that is capable and efficacious of, again, cultivating and promoting within us attributes that would belong to a life filled with hope. Now, we've already talked about a number of those. We've talked about patience. Does the hope that I have as a Christian, does it empower me to have patience while I'm waiting? Does my hope empower me to have perseverance as I encounter many storms and, and wars and, and battles along the way? Does the hope that I possess as a Christian, does it empower me to live a life of purity? Because the Bible is very clear. Without holiness, none of us will see the face of the Lord in peace. You see, that hope should empower me to live a life of purity because without it, I'll never realize that hope. But then fourthly, does the hope that I have as a Christian, does it empower me to maintain a pilgrim's perspective? We introduced that the last time that we were together. 
And doesn't that make those earlier questions about being pilgrims very important? Is that how I see myself? As a pilgrim? Does that recognition, does that impact the way I live? A pilgrim's perspective. Well, the last time we were together, we we noted examples of God's people in the past who possessed a pilgrim's perspective that was, in fact, empowered by hope. It was prompted by hope. And for them, it did significantly impact the way they lived their lives. Remember who that was? Abraham and Sarah. Let me invite you quickly back to the Hall of Fame of the Faithful, Hebrews chapter 11. And you might remember, uh, inasmuch as uh, it was within that context, that it afforded us an excellent opportunity to make this very salient point about a living hope. Friends, a living hope is impossible without a living faith. Remember, faith is the substance of, It's the very essence, it's the substructure, it's the foundation of the things hoped for. But then we also get that concept of perspective, because what is it? Our faith is also the evidence of things not seen. (laughs) Faith allows us to see, if you will, the invisible. It gives us that perspective, that ability. But anyways, listen once again, to what the Bible says about Abraham and Sarah. How that they journeyed through this life keeping a pilgrim's perspective. Look there at Hebrews chapter 11. We'll pick up, uh, first of all, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned. Keep that word in mind. He sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. Keep that word in mind. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now drop down to verse 13. These all died in faith. Now he has uh, also incorporated Sarah in in that uh uh, uh, that uh, pronoun, these, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. You see the hope that is empowering them? They had this hope through the promises of God. But they had not come to realize those hopes, but having embraced them, having seen them afar off and embraced them, they were persuaded of them and embraced them. And notice, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now... They desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hmm. You see, those, those verses, friends, they document for us Abraham and Sarah's pilgrim perspective. And having such a perspective, did you see how it it governed their earthly lives that they lived? It was for that reason that they dwelled in tents. They didn't take up permanent residence. They understood they're just pilgrims. They're just sojourning through this life. And again, that perspective allowed them to see things in their true relationship. They were looking forward to something. That hope, again made possible through the promises of God. But you know what? Those verses not only document for us Abraham and Sarah's pilgrim's perspective. May I submit further that it accurately represents for us the narrative that should define our lives? Isn't that the same narrative 
that should define our lives, the Christian's life, especially those Christians who are living a life filled with faith, filled with hope. You see, like Abraham, we've been called out by God through the gospel. Like Abraham, we are told of something that is yet future, a promise that we are given of an inheritance. And God calls upon us to obey that call, recognize that we're just traveling through this earth, but all the while looking forward to that city that He has promised us. I, I, would, repre- I would suggest that that represents what we should be all about. So, to illustrate that, now let's turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Hopefully you recall the last time we were together, the, we, we noted that the subject of hope is given conspicuous emphasis in Peter's first inspired letter. In fact, so much so that uh, we, we found commentators who ascribed to Peter the epitaph, the apostle of hope. <laughs> you know, like Paul is the apostle of faith, John the apostle of love, Peter, the apostle of hope. In fact, may I submit that a careful reading of 1 Peter would likely bring us to the conclusion that what Peter was urging his initial readers was to do this. Live a life that is filled with hope. I mean, that's what he seems to to be offering by way of counsel. Live a life that is filled with hope. Look at chapter 1 and verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, now the American Standard Version renders that, and hope perfectly, perfectly. You see, it's, it's an adjective that describes, or an adverb that describes completely. Hope completely, hope perfectly. It's as though Peter was saying, have a life that's filled with hope. But then turn over to chapter 3, because you remember among the questions that we put forth for our honest consideration and contemplation for ourselves is, does the hope that I have in me exhibit itself so conspicuously to others who live around me that they see it in me and would ask, why do you have such hope? (laughs) Listen to what Peter says in chapter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you what? A reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Friends, friends, doesn't that presume? Why would anyone ask you of the hope that is in you unless they can see it? Unless they observe it? And how else would they observe it other than by our attitudes, by our conduct, by our behavior? They recognize we are individuals that have hope. <laughs> and it's so, it so fills us that it's conspicuous in the lives that we live. And so they would ask, how is it that you have that hope? What's the reason for that hope? Peter says that's what they, those Christians of the first century, should be striving for. And so again, I believe... Peter's appeal is the very one that we're entertaining. That as Christians, those initial readers that he was writing to would live their lives filled with hope. Now, if you accept that, then couple that with the notice of the terms that are used by Peter in addressing his initial audience. Back up to chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse 11. Peter writes, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Mm. (laughs) Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Friends, doesn't that exactly echo 
what the Hebrews writer said regarding Abraham and Sarah. What they said of themselves, what they confessed of themselves, having embraced the promises that God had given to them, they confessed they were, what, strangers and pilgrims in this world. And now here is Peter writing to Christians and he says, Brethren, recognize you are strangers and pilgrims. Now, at least in the King James Version, same two words in the English. Strangers and pilgrims. Hebrews 11, 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, I will tell you, if you want to do any word study, uh, the, the original term for stranger in Hebrews 11 and verse, uh, I think that's verse 13, is a little different. But it has the same connotation. Same connotation. And, and we'll look at that in just a minute. So here's what I want us to understand. Here is Peter, and he is urging these Christians to live their lives filled with hope. And as he does that, he will address them as strangers and pilgrims. Why? (laughs) Why? No doubt. No doubt the connection is he wanted them to see themselves in that role as strangers and pilgrims. And he wanted them, he was urging them to maintain the perspective, the mental perception of things that would correspond to such a status as a stranger and pilgrim. So join with me as we think about these meaningful designations for a minute. Stranger, a stranger. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. Now, in the original, literally, the word is to dwell beside. To dwell beside. And so what it denoted was an individual who lives in a land among other people, but they themselves are foreigners. They're aliens. One Greek reference work explains it this way, that this word signifies, quote, In the New Testament, a stranger, a foreigner, one who lives in a place, listen to it, without the right of citizenship. Boy, doesn't that have a contemporary context? (laughs) What's one of the big political hot buttons, you know, over the past couple years? Illegal immigrants? What are we talking about? Individuals who have come into our land, our country, without the right of citizenship and living as foreigners. Alien. So we understand the term, right? We understand the concept. But that same Greek reference work goes on to expound this about it. Metaphorically, it says it identifies, quote, one who lives on earth as a stranger a sojourner on the earth. And then it goes on to say, even more specifically, quote, of Christians whose home is in heaven. Now, I said in in the Hebrew passage about Abraham and Sarah, it's a different original word, but believe me, it carries with it the same meaning. In fact, Vine says, a foreigner, a stranger, an alien. I don't know about you, but, but that language, that, that concept took my mind directly to Paul's comments to the Christians in Philippi. Because you remember what he reminded them of concerning their conversation? In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul said, For our conversation is in Heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in our vernacular, conversation has a very limited, limited application. We, we usually talk about it referencing our speech, right? And so, possibly better borne out in the American Standard Version, the word conversation is translated citizenship. Read it that way. 
Paul is saying, for our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? You don't have to know, you don't have to know Greek for this. If you would look up that Greek term, translated conversation, American Standard Version, citizenship, Philippians 3 and verse 20, if you would look it up and see it translated into English, you know what word you would see in it? Politics. <laughs> that, that's where we get our English word politics from. It's talking about citizenship. And so here is Paul urging us to remember our citizenship is in heaven. And so if that is, as Christians, if that is where our true citizenship is in heaven, you know what that means? Here on earth, we're strangers. (laughs) We're foreigners. We're aliens. While we are sojourning on this earth. So now back to Philipp, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. The first word is strangers, I beseech you. As strangers, second word, pilgrims. Now, I must tell you, in the original, very similar in meaning as stranger. In fact, it's hard for me to distinguish the difference. Listen to what Vine says about that word translated pilgrims. Quote, it signifies sojourning in a strange place. Among, away from one's own people. He goes on to explain, quote, The word is thus used metaphorically of those to whom heaven is their true country and are sojourners on earth. End of quote. Boy, that sounds a lot like stranger, doesn't it? Now, in a moment, uh, I'll try to offer maybe a distinction uh, a slight difference that we might make by way of application. But, but right now, let, let's just think about that. A pilgrim. Again, one who is sojourning in a strange place, away from their own people. You know what I find especially interesting? In our you know, developing this out of the book of Peter, Look back at how Peter initially addressed these Christians. Go back to the the salutation, if you will. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, very briefly, concisely identifies himself. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the, what's the first word? Strangers. Scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, Those were provinces of Asia Minor, today modern-day Turkey. But how does he address them? Strangers. Now, I will tell you, some are inclined to find in that language because some versions have, instead of scattered, strangers of the dispersion. And that term, dispersion, does have a literal application to Jews who were scattered among the Gentiles. And so there are some commentators who would actually suggest that about Peter's greeting here. He's talking about Jews who were scattered among the Gentiles. I, I got to tell you, when you start reading the book of 1 Peter, the content of the letter clearly, clearly reflects that Peter recognized that many, if not most, of his initial readers were Gentile Christians, not Jewish So, I'm more inclined to agree with what Brother Wood says about the use, Peter's use of the term. And let me just read this for you quickly. He offers, first of all, you know, again, the the word sojourners refers to people who have left their native land and are living temporarily on foreign soil and among strangers. It literally means to dwell alongside those of a strange land. And then he goes on to offer about the word dispersion or scattered And how that some would apply that to the Jewish audience. But here's what he says. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, that's where we started. The author uses this same word where it is translated pilgrim. And there, obviously, in a figurative sense. For Christians generally. Without regard to former relationships or races. And it is therefore probable 
that in 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, Peter intended to indicate by sojourners or strangers all people of God who were then sojourning on the earth among unbelievers and therefore a more comprehensive sense than the literal term would in- indicate. And I, I agree with him. I, I, think, I think as in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter starts out by addressing them pilgrims, strangers, sojourners, sojourners. So here is this inspired epistle that Peter writes, emphasizing God's promise of the future hope of eternal life. And within it, Peter keeps reminding these Christians of their current status. You are sojourners. You're foreigners. You're aliens. You're pilgrims. Now, we looked at two, right? First Peter 1 and verse 1. First Peter 2 and verse 11. Those are not the only ones. Uh, look at another one. Look at First Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. Listen again to the language. Peter writes, And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Friends, that is the same word, or at least derived from the same word, translated pilgrim in First Peter 2 and verse 11. He's reminding them time and time again. He's constantly keeping before their hearts and their minds the fact that they are foreigners who are sojourning on the earth amidst people who are not of the same homeland. Who are not of the same homeland, heaven. And and may I suggest that it's not just the use of those terms that bears this out about the emphasis of of reminding them that they are strangers and foreigners, but also even the imagery that seems to connect itself to this same concept that is employed by Peter. And isn't it significant that you find that imagery in the first exhortation that Peter will give? Now, the first exhortation of this letter isn't until chapter 1 and verse 13. And notice how it begins. Wherefore. You remember what they say about when you see a wherefore, right? Or a therefore. Look what it is there for. All right. So wherefore is a connective word. It is drawing your minds back to what has been said. And it's going to make an, it's going to make an, uh, an, an emphatic exhortation based upon what's already been said. Well, what has Peter been talking about? Go all the way back to chapter 1 and verse 3. What was Paul pray or what was Peter praising and blessing God for? Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten again, us again unto a living hope. Living hope. I mean, that's the first thing that Peter calls to their attention. Being among the elect of God, being the the chosen of God, verse 2, praise God because now God has begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then he goes on in the subsequent verses to identify the hope to an inheritance. That's our hope. Eternal life, incorruptible, undefiled, reserved, uh, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. All right? Then he talks about this hope being the ultimate salvation. Here is the verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And then he says concerning this end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, the culmination of this hope, what does he say? It's been the it's been the focus of the prophets ever from the beginning. Friends, that entire first section has to do with hope. The Christian's hope. <laughs> he spends so much time on the subject of hope. And verse 13, now he comes to his first exhortation. And what does he base it on? That hope. Wherefore, in light of this hope, Gird up your 
loins of your mind. Be sober and what? Hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here he is emphasizing this hope that Christians are to fill their lives with. And he says, if you embrace that, if you have that, then gird up the loins of your mind. What in the world? You see, that imagery would have been very meaningful to Peter's initial audience of the first century. It's probably lost on us. Consider again Brother Woods' comments to find meaning in the language, in the imagery. Girding meant to gather up long flowing garments by means of a belt or girdle. It was a, a reference to the mode of dress Characteristic of the people in Oriental lands who, when they desired to run to set out on a trip, work, or otherwise engage in activity, they gathered up their outer garment about them tightly so as not to impede or be hindered in that which they sought to do. Maybe more current for us in context, if you ever watch Westerns, those ladies with those long dresses, they're going to ride a horse or they're going to, you know, they're going to go out to the well. What do they do? Tuck it in or tie it in a knot. Same thing. They're girding it up. And as Brother Woods helps us understand, the purpose of that is to not allow it to impede them in what they were going to do. So here's the application. The usage here, of course, is figurative. It refers to the gathering up of all improper thoughts, feelings, and activities of the mind, and restraining them that they might not hinder one's progress toward heaven. You know what that imagery has to do with? Our being sojourners. (laughs) We're pilgrims. And we're in our native dress, if you will, and we got to gird it up. And so Peter makes the application, well, you need to do that with your mind. You need to gird up all those unrestrained thoughts and feelings that would otherwise impede you as a pilgrim who is sojourning through this earth toward heaven. Be sober. Exercise restraint. Because remember, we're living among a people who are not of our citizenship. They're not from heaven. They're tied to this earth. And so we need to be sober. Another commentator, I thought, really, really makes the connection to this idea of our being a pilgrims. He said, quote, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, as if he said, Wherefore, since you are so honored and distinguished as above, gird up the loins of your mind. You have a journey to go on. <laughs> you have a race to run, a warfare to accomplish, a great work to do. And as the traveler, the racer, the warrior, the laborer, gather in and gird up the long and loose garments that they may be more ready, prompt, and expeditious in their business. So do you your minds, your inner man, and affection seated there. Gird them. Gather them in. Let them not hang loose and neglected about you. Restrain their extravagances and let the loins or strength and vigor of your minds be exerted in your duty. Listen to it. Disengage yourselves from all that would hinder you and go on resolutely in your obedience. Friends, I I think here, in addition or in this exhortation, we can see advance that notion of a pilgrim's perspective. Because he's talking about your mind, a mental perception. And so here you are recognizing that you're a pilgrim, you're a stranger, you're a sojourner on the earth. You need to have the proper mindset. Have the proper mindset. 
Now, I mentioned to you there, there might be a, a slight distinction to be found in stranger and pilgrim. Maybe it's this. The word stranger speaks to our relationship to those about us. Remember, we're foreigners. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're here on the earth. We're we're with people. And we don't have any true citizenship here. So foreigner. Stranger, foreigner. Pilgrim might have to do with time. Time. See, we're just here for a short time. We're in that status. We're foreigners. And please understand, friends, I believe Peter, as you read through Peter's writings, initially I thought most of this persecution that was coming upon them was from the Roman government. I'm not sure I agree with that anymore. I think my mind has changed a little bit. Now, certainly Nero had started things off. And this is probably written about the time that Nero, you know, started accusing the Christians for setting the fire that burned Rome and all of that. But, you know, most of that was kind of limited to Rome. Now, maybe Peter alludes to the fact it's going to get worse. He talks about that. You know, get ready. It's going to get worse. And it does. Persecution by the Roman government among, by Domitian and other emperors, far worse than what Nero did. But, But you know what already was in place that served as a trial of their faith? Is the fact that when they became Christians, they changed their citizenship. And now, all of a sudden, they're living as foreigners among those who at one time, they used to be like. When you read 1 Peter 4, that's what he's talking about. He says, now you're living a different life. And so those who are around you, they start mocking you. They ridicule you. And they, you know, they start asking you, why don't you run with us anymore? Why aren't you like us anymore? So I'm really thinking much of the tribulation and trial of their faith that Peter alludes to was because of their fact that they were foreigners now. They were strangers. I read a book or am in the process of reading The Church in Exile by Brother James Thompson. And that's what it is. God's counterculture in a non-Christian world. And that's what these Christians were now experiencing. In becoming a Christian, they changed their citizenship. And all of a sudden, they looked and acted different than those about them. And that invited criticism. And so maybe the second one has to do about, the pilgrim has to do about, it's temporary. It's temporary. It's almost as though Peter says, yes, when when you became a Christian, you, you all of a sudden now became exiles on the earth. You're like foreigners. You're like aliens. And that's going to invite some problems. But please remember, it's just a short pilgrimage. Remember Abraham and Sarah? Where were they keep looking? Why were they willing to do these things? They kept looking for that city. They knew it was just a short time. They're staying in tents. They're dwelling in tabernacles. They understood this is a, this is a temporary thing. And so even if you gotta suffer, remember it's just short. It's brief. You're just a pilgrim here. And isn't that Isn't that what is presented to us in a song? I think we sang the last time we were together. This world is not my home. Listen to it. There's the foreigner. This world is not my home. What's the next phrase? I'm just passing through. It's temporary. I'm a foreigner. I'm a stranger. But I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. And isn't that what Jesus told us to expect? Isn't that what he tried to prepare his disciples for? If the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, if you weren't a stranger, if you weren't a foreigner, if you weren't an alien, the world would love you because it loves its own. But because you are not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. See, we should anticipate that. We should expect that. 
that we're going to be treated like aliens, foreigners, because our citizenship isn't theirs. Our hope isn't theirs. But here's the thing to take take good delight in. It's just a short trip. I'm just a pilgrim. And where my true citizenship is, my homeland, that's what I'm looking forward to. I once heard a preacher, I think it was Ronnie Hayes. I don't think I heard him personally. Maybe it was through a CD. Or, and I tried to find it and I couldn't. But I, I heard him talk about heaven as our home. And he made, he made a, a profound observation. He says, when heaven is your home, you see things differently. See, that's the pilgrim's perspective. He says, you see things differently. And then he said, you see people differently. You see possessions differently. You see problems differently. You see pressures differently. And I thought about it, if we would take the time, and we're not going to, but if we would take the time, we could develop each of those out of 1 Peter. Peter urges them to see people differently, to see their possessions differently, to see their problems, their suffering differently, the pressures that are put upon them by their, you know, by their neighbors and their friends and their old acquaintances. See it differently. Why? Because heaven is your home. That's where your true citizenship is. That's where you're supposed to be looking for your Savior to come back and take you with Him. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sits in the right hand of God. Don't set your affections here on earth, but set your affections above. Because when Christ comes, you're going to share in His glory. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. Here we are, but straying pilgrims. Do you see yourself that way? Does it make a difference in your life? How you see things, your perspective on life? It should. It should. And it will, if you live a life filled with hope. So if you haven't started on the pilgrimage, the the sojourn yet, everyone does it the same way. We are called out of the world to this new community of believers. And that call comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You answer it as all do in faith, believing Jesus to be the Son of God, believing it to such a degree that you are willing unashamedly to confess it before others. But then you've got to repent of your sins. You see, you've changed your citizenship. And therefore, the laws by which you live, the Lord who is governing your life is different than the laws and the Lord of the past. So now you you changed your attitude. You're, You're submitting to a new Lord and a new law. And that turns you from sin. But then you have to be immersed. You have to be immersed in, in water. You have to be baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's where the transition changes. That's where the transition occurs. That, that's, that's when you die to your old self and enter this new relationship that you're a stranger, you're a fo- foreigner on earth, but you belong in heaven. And that's where we're all longing to go.